jump in and tell me to stop, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So welcome to hat making, how Fedora is run and why. To be honest, there's not going to be a whole lot of time for the why, but I could sneak a little bit in there. So let's see if it'll actually let me advance the slides. All right, slide showing is advanced. Everyone good? Yep. yep, it worked. All right, here are the things we're going to talk about. I'm not going to read them to you because we're going to get to them. But first, I want to do a little housekeeping. Um, if you have nice things to say about the talk or about me and how wonderful I am, uh, you can at me on Twitter. Uh, there's my email. I'm on IRC. Um, if you have not nice things, you can keep them to yourself. Um, this is uh, under CC by SA 4.0 International, which is the default license for these talks. And even though I did upload the slides to Nextcloud already, when I put these together, that hadn't been given to me yet. So they're also available uh, through that URL and the QR code. Also, I always put disclaimers in my talks, unlike uh, certain Richard Browns I could mention. Um, so I want to cover two. Like this one actually does sort of represent organizations I'm attached to, which is kind of a nice change. Um, but as you can tell by how fast I'm talking, this is a highly compressed and very lossy talk. Uh, I've given 45 minute talks on like two slides from this one. So there's a lot that we're not covering that we're just going to touch on really quickly. Uh, that's the, the joys of a short time slot. Uh, I'll do my best to touch on the high level things and I'm always happy to talk about stuff later. And I want to make clear that this is Fedora's way. It's not necessarily the one true way. Uh, you know, I pitched this talk with the idea that Fedora and OpenSUSE are friends um, in a very meaningful way. We share a lot of contributors. We share a lot of technology. We work together. We're not really competing. I want to share what Fedora does that is mostly successful for how we work with, with you. I want to learn more about how OpenSUSE works so we can make Fedora better. This is truly given in the spirit of open source. Um, so who am I? Uh, I'm me. I'm a senior program manager at Red Hat. My primary day job is being the Fedora program manager. I'm also the program manager for CentOS Stream, which we won't talk about beyond uh, a couple slides from now. And I'm a minor contributor to a handful of open source communities. Um, been in Fedora for 10-ish, 11 years now. Uh, but I also um, work on a couple small applications um, that are, uh, you know, have user bases measured in the hundreds. Um, I like to jump in and help here and there uh, where I can. So what is Fedora? Hopefully you're at least passingly familiar with the project. Uh, yes, it is a hat, but it's more than just a very stylish hat. Uh, it's a community. You know, people tend to use Fedora as a shorthand for the bits we release, but we like to say that Fedora is, is a community first. Um, it's a community of non-Red Hat employees, um, sometimes future Red Hat employees. Uh, it's a community of Red Hat employees who work on Fedora as their day job, and it's a community of Red Hat employees working on Fedora outside their day job. So just because somebody uh, works at Red Hat, that doesn't mean their contributions to Fedora are in any way related to what Red Hat pays them to do. Um, and this makes it a really uh, interesting mix because, you know, obviously Red Hat has a lot of influence in the direction that Fedora takes, um, but the community, you know, has a lot too. And sometimes people uh, argue um, one position or another, depending on if they're acting in their capacity of their day job or as a volunteer contributor. And it's really not even fair to say that Fedora is a community. Um, we're a group of communities, and I'll go into that a little more in a moment. But if you've seen the film Finding Nemo, you know, the scene where they have the bunch of tuna caught in the net, and they're all swimming in different directions, and then Nemo's like, swim downward. And they all swim downward, and they you know break open the net. The analogy is a little strained. But, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, Fedora teams have a lot of autonomy. And so we're generally working in the same sort of general direction, uh, but there's not like a single unified, you know, sense of direction within Fedora. 
Um, if you ask 2000 contributors their opinion on something, you'll probably get 3000 answers. But we also make stuff. We don't just hang out with each other. Um, so we have three flagship editions, a server, workstation, and IoT targeted at what they sound like. We have a couple of rising editions, uh, Fedora Core OS and Fedora Silver Blue, which are powered by the RPM OS tree technology and you know, designed for uh, containerized or container workloads and desktops, respectively. And then we have a bunch of what we call spins and labs. Um, these are different desktop environments or uh, offerings really focused on a specific use case like computational neuroscience or open source design or you know, teaching Python in a classroom. And I just put a bunch of text there because putting all the images in would one take a long time and I'm lazy, but also uh, it would just fill up the screen. So we make a lot of stuff that we give to people. My screen went black. All right, let's share. All right, Ben, let's be honest here. Is that your way of implying that the way Fedora is built and why is a black box? That wasn't, you weren't supposed to know that, but yes. Okay. Let's see if this is going to work now. Share. Hey, it's back. Okay. In the form of Chrome browser, I think. Or Firefox. Firefox. Even better. All right. So here's where I was. All right. So Fedora exists in an ecosystem. Um, so Fedora is the upstream of CentOS Stream, which is the upstream of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which is the upstream of CentOS Linux. Um, so it's really, you know, we, we're focusing on different use cases here. Fedora is really being geared towards operating system developers. And obviously, you know, it's just like which developer use cases we're targeting. It's, you know, used for desktop OS all the time. Um, Stream is ecosystem developers and RHEL is enterprise application developers. And that's the last you will hear about anything downstream from Fedora, if I remember my talk correctly. So let's talk about the governance of the project a little bit. Uh, we have the Fedora Council, which is a top level governance body that sets goals, uh, governs finances and trademarks, doesn't have a lot of ability to actually make stuff happen other than influence and making pouty eyes at people. Um, but we, basically have the ultimate decision-making authority, um, the, the Supreme Court, if you will, of complaints. Uh, and the council works on a uh, consensus model. So basically we all have to at least not oppose something for it to pass. That usually works out, sometimes causes frustration. So we have members, um, let's run through real quickly. If you see a, a red hat next to the name, that means it's a position funded by red hat. Uh, very clever. So we have a project leader, a community action and impact coordinator that we call the F cake because holy crap, community action and impact coordinator is a lot of syllables. Uh, we, we elect two members from the community, uh, one every six months and they serve one year terms. We have what are called objectives, which are basically 12 to 18 months sort of broad, um, you know, major goals within the, the project. Uh, and the leaders of those objectives have seats on the council. We have representatives from the engineering and mindshare committees, which I'll touch on in a moment. We have me as the program manager, and then we have the diversity and inclusion team representative, who I will also talk about momentarily. So the engineering steering committee is an engineering oversight body. Uh, they basically make decisions on technical changes, uh, resolve packaging disputes, approve the release schedule, things like that. Um, and it's a nine member body that's entirely elected by the community. There are no appointed positions. Uh, that said, there tend to be quite a few Red Hat employees on there uh, because Red Hat employees are often the ones who have the time to devote to it and have the community um, recognition. But we also have people who are outside of Red Hat on the FESCO, such as uh, a certain Neil Gampa I could mention. Um, and then we have the Mindshare Committee, which is basically everything not engineering. Um, and so they do ambassadors, marketing, websites. Uh, that group has a membership of two elected members, 
and then the component teams um, each select a representative to the committee. So uh, it's still very community driven, just not quite as directly elected as the way FESCO is. Uh, and the F cake also serves ex officio on that committee. We have a diversity and inclusion team, which does uh, what you think it does. Um, it reports directly to the Fedora Council because we want to make it clear that diversity and inclusion are important values within our community. Uh, we fall short on our goals in that, as most open source projects do, but it is something we value and we're working hard to fix. Uh, and they run Fedora Women's Day, which is actually happening today, uh, and other events aimed at promoting uh, diversity and inclusion within our project. So if you put it all together, here's sort of the org chart. Uh, it's a little out of date, but it's the general idea. Uh, you can see how there are many layers of things, and within... Uh, reason most of these teams have a lot of uh, independence on how they work. So, you know, the council sort of sets broad goals and broad constraints, and then um, people work within those. Okay, and I can't not talk about uh, the corporate sponsor. Um, Red Hat and, you know, therefore IBM provides financial and material sponsorship. They are generally pretty hands off, despite what some people in the community think sometimes. Um, you know, I've never had my manager come to me and say, Fedora must do this, even mm -hmm. though my manager is also the manager of uh, the program manage program managers for RHEL. So, uh, you know, the work we do in Fedora definitely impacts the rest of my team. But to some degree, they kind of have to deal with whatever Fedora gives them in a way. Um, that's not to say that, you know, Red Hat won't make changes when it when it comes time to fork RHEL from Fedora. Uh, but by and large, they don't just swoop in and say, you must do this or else. Um, there are some things that certainly feel that way, uh, but by and large, that's not the case. Uh, Red Hat understands that the community is a key component of Fedora, and without uh, you know, with driving them away, we no longer have a Fedora to provide to people. All right, so when I talked about giving a 45-minute talk, um, there is um, a talk I gave at DevConf Check a couple years ago that goes into this in great detail. So we're going to start in very shallow detail. The goals of our technical changes process are communication, coordination, and accountability. It's really not about gatekeeping. Um, it's basically making sure that other people in the project are aware of what's going on, making sure we get it into the release notes, make sure QA knows about it so they can test things appropriately, stuff like that. Um, and then making sure that when you say, I'm going to do this, that you're actually, uh, that it actually gets in. So we have two categories to our changes process. There's system wide changes and self contained changes. And they are, excuse me, they are fairly uh, as, you know, uh, as described, basically it's just a way of kind of categorizing the scope and the impact of the change. And so when you submit a change proposal, you, there are th things like a detailed description, so like what it is you're actually doing, um, a contingency plan, so what happens if it goes terribly wrong, um, things like impact upgrade, um, because we do block on uh, upgradability from one release to another. Um, and then, you know, check with release engineering to make sure like, hey, can we actually build this thing that I want to do? Uh, is it going to require changes to the build system? Uh, is it going to make Pierre very sad? Things like that. So the life cycle of a change proposal is it gets submitted to me as the program manager. I make sure it has all the boxes checked, send it to the develop announce mailing list. And we give the community a, a one week period to comment on it. Um, that's basically a chance to say, whoa, this is actually a terrible idea, and let me tell you why. And boy, do we get that sometimes. Um, in the prior iteration of this process, the, uh, the comments happened generally after Fesco voted on it, which seemed like a really backwards way to do it. So when we reinvented this uh, 12, 13 releases ago, uh, this is what we did. Um, so after the community has had time to comment on it, it gets sent to Fesco for approval. Um, and then throughout the release process, we check to make sure, hey, is this being done? Do we need to back it out? Do we need to move it to another release? So leading into that, the release schedule. 
Um, so just to make Richard very upset, uh, we do have set releases. We release, um, do major releases every April and October. Um, we don't do any minor releases or official respins because the uh, life, si life cycle is short enough that it doesn't really make sense to do point releases. And releases reach an end of life four years after, or four weeks, excuse me, after the N minus two release. Uh, so essentially, releases have about a 13 month uh, period where we provide updates. We don't do an alpha anymore, but we do do a beta release about five weeks before GA. Um, and then we have a rolling development stream, which we call Rawhide. So I'm not going to like go through all of these, but these are some of the key release milestones. So at a very high level, it's a uh, propo proposal submission deadline. We do a mass rebuild. We uh, have a checkpoint to make sure changes are code uh, testable. We branch the new release from Rawhide. Do a freeze for beta so that QA has something to test against. We do a beta release. We do a freeze for final. And then we do a final release. And then we all go, oh. So let's drill in on the, the process of the release a little more. So I talked earlier about, you know, we have blockers, we have release criteria we have to meet, uh, but not all deliverables are release blocking. So basically our additions, the KDE spin, um, and that's basically it. Uh, so other things can be, if they're broken and, you know, we want them to get fixed, but we're not going to hold up the release for the entire suite of deliverables. Um, so we do have requirements that are defined in our release criteria. We do make exceptions sometime if something is just notoriously hard to fix or if it came in really late and the impact we, we feel is low. Um, so we conduct weekly review meetings to you know, make the community decision on that. Uh, and the idea behind a freeze is to give QA a fixed target to test against um, and to try and minimize the disruption during that stabilization period. Um, we make exceptions to fix blockers, obviously. And if there are other significant issues, particularly if they affect live media, then we'll uh, allow an exception to fix those. And we also have what we call a prioritized bugs process, which are things that are important, um, usually like highly visible, but not release blocking. Um, and that's basically a way for um, people to sort of flag it as important issues. And if it gets accepted as a prioritized bug, then Matthew Miller and I uh, go and pester people until they're fixed. Then we have a, a go, no go decision. So that's basically a check of are all the blockers fixed? Do we actually have a release candidate? Is it tested? And then if not, we'll push it back a week and try again. So yesterday was supposed to be our first go, no go. Uh, we waiting on a, a signed shim for the release because of things I won't get into now. So we pushed it back to next week. So we're aiming at target date number one. Um, and we don't rerun composes if a non-blocking deliverable didn't build. Uh, so I'll get into some other stuff real quick. We use Bugzilla for bug tracking. Um, I have lots of opinions about that, both good and bad, but that's what we use. Um, we branch the bugs so that when we so when we branch the code, um, so basically the if you file an issue against Rawhide, uh, it'll get you know do it now and it'll become a Fedora 34 bug when we do the branch uh, early in the winter. We close the end of life bugs one month after the N minus two release, which always makes people really sad. And I have to make sure I check the uh, don't send me updates box because I'll get a lot of people commenting like, how dare you? I'll never use Fedora again because you didn't fix this bug. And gosh, I really wish we would get, would get every bug fixed. Uh, that's just not a reality for us at the moment. So how do we build the packages? Uh, we have a disk git that um, on source.fedoraproject.org that provides the spec files and any patches that we carry um, and a, a look aside cache for the actual source tarballs. We have a concept called proven packagers, where if you've you know, proven yourself as a packager, you can uh, Fesco can grant you this status, and then you can step in and make changes to other packages that other people maintain, which is really helpful when we have you know mass changes to packages because we're changing you know something in the build steps or when somebody's just non-responsive and we need to fix an issue quickly. Um, there has been some discussion about moving to a source git model. We are not there yet, but um, I just I did want to say, yes, that is something we think about sometimes. 
Uh, so for the build system, we use Koji and we also have copper for unofficial builds. So that's a lot of times um, people will package like the upstreams development branch there for testing or things that, you know, for whatever reason, you just don't want to get into as uh, fit official Fedora packages. And copper um, also provides build environments for other um, RPM based distributions. And then we use Bodhi to gate updates. So, you know, generally during a, and you know, once the activation period has been reached, um, you submit an update and it sits in the testing repo for a week or until it gets, you know, three car karma votes. Um, package maintainers have the ability to, to adjust that, but that's just basically sort of a way to try and prevent um, things that looked good initially, but actually break further from hitting the main repos. And so even with the the distract, distraction, I got in a couple minutes under time. I'll leave the reminders up and I'll take my last few minutes for questions. Uh, Kevin asks, OpenQA is used, isn't it? Um, yeah, so we do use OpenQA for our automated testing. Uh, a lot of our testing is also done by hand. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of stuff that runs in OpenQA um, because there's no way we could do all that stuff manually. And there's a lot of stuff that you just don't want to do manually. So, uh, hello, uh, thanks for the talk. I have a question regarding you said that uh, you close the bugs when you are reaching the end of life. Um, does it mean that the bug needs to be reported again for a more recent uh, version? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, a few weeks before I do the end of life close, there's an automated update that happens. It says, hey, if this is still an issue, change it to a supported version or it will get closed. Um, people can reopen the bug if it gets closed and they're like, no, this is actually still a problem. You can reopen it against a supported version. So it's not, it's really not a go away. We never want to think about this again. It's more of a, you know, we're just going to close it. And if it's still an issue, somebody will reopen it and hopefully we'll get to it this time. Um, there, are, there are some bugs that have gone through that process several times. Um, so, yeah. Uh, in the chat, Axel asks, does Fedora Project have a legal structure like foundation? Uh, our legal structure is Red Hat Incorporated. Um, so Red Hat owns the trademarks, uh, things like that, and the Fedora Council has the authority to make decisions about usage of the trademark and stuff, but um, we do not exist as an independent entity from Red Hat uh, in legal terms. Um, this has its advantages and disadvantages, and I'm not sure honestly which one I think is the better approach, but uh, this is the way we have it. Okay, so the question is, uh, from the chat, for the government's par governance part, I'm wondering for the people in positions seated by Red Hat, are they employed full-time for that, part-time? Do they get paid at all? Um, so for the three I highlighted on uh, the Fedora Council, the F project leader, the, the F Cake, and myself, those are basically full-time funded positions. Those are our jobs. Um, for other people who happen to be Red Hat employees uh, who serve on mindshare or fesco or the council uh those are uh, volunteer positions even though they're at red hat uh, because they're not doing it as part of their job uh, brett had a question i know that fedora is usually good at keeping the ecosystem free does fedora also deblob the linux kernel like debian does i think we ship some blobs but we try and keep to a minimum, Neil, do you actually? Do yeah, you know so, yeah. So the, about? yeah, so the Linux kernel as shipped in Fedora is pretty close to mainline Linux. Um, blobs are typically um, pulled out and separated into their own files, um, either shipped from the kernel source package if they were part of kernel or they're part of kernel firmware. Um, in general, they're runtime loaded, um, so if they don't exist, things shouldn't fail. But uh, we do ship them. It is our major exception to our 
policy of everything needs to be free software because we the the as the saying goes, we all want free software. We want to maximize freedom, but we also want our computers to work. And so that's basically our I think our sole exception really. Thanks, Neil. Uh, Kevin said. Um, for Bugzilla and bug tracking, I wonder if there's any way distros could pool resources to fix the same upstream issues. Uh, there probably are. I think it's a little hard to coordinate that um, at, on a broad scale. We generally, in Fedora, follow an upstream first model. So we'd really like bugs to be fixed uh, in the upstream. Um, that said, you know, sometimes our package maintainers will, you know, uh, bring a patch in and backport it. Uh, just to get the fix out to Fedora user sooner, or if upstream doesn't want to accept it for some reason. Um, and so like uh, Red Hat Bugzilla does have fields where you can tie, you know, you can link to the upstream issue tracker, um, but there's not necessarily a good way to, to coordinate that in a federated way. Um, but that's one thing I would love to see is uh, more structured, let's say coordination between distros on doing stuff like that. Cause I think a lot of times what ends up happening is um, we end up duplicating work and there is just not enough people around to be able to afford that. Uh, it seems like Stasiak has a question here. I don't know if you saw it. Um, he's asking for the governance part, I'm wondering if for the people in position seated by Red Hat, are they employed full time for that part time, or do they get paid at all, or is it uh, just all slave labor? I I answered that already. Oh, sorry, I missed it. Yeah. Pay attention, Neil. Oh Jesus, <laughs> there's so much to pay attention to. <laughs> that's that's okay. I, I'm used to Neil ignoring me. He's a very smart man. Oh man, that right. I never so ignore you. So are we. <laughs> wow, I feel hurt and attacked. <laughs> I, I think that's basically my time. I have seconds remaining. So I appreciate everyone for your attention and your questions. And I will uh, stop my screen sharing now and go back into listening mode. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk. <laughs>